don't know if you've ever seen sort of dramatic makeover stories like that before. Um, and they really are very powerful. Um, and it sort of speaks to the heart. We've been talking about the idea of transformation. And oftentimes when you see a story like that, they'll say to the person, are you ready to see the new you? Are you ready to see um, this new version of you? And it's interesting because it really, it gets me thinking about what transformation is about. Because for that man, of course, I don't know him and I've never met him. He, he had this dramatic transformation, this dramatic experience. But is he a new you? I mean, it is who he is at his core and, and something like that when you're homeless. I mean, that can add dignity and all kinds of good things. But is he a new person? Especially if, if his circumstances haven't changed. Or really, even if his circumstances have changed, is he a new person. What does it mean to be transformed is the question that I want us to kind of wrestle with a little bit this morning. It's interesting because I think there's a lot of assumptions out there in our world today about what it means to be a Christian. In fact, if you were to ask kind of a, a survey of people, you might survey a hundred different people, you may get a hundred different answers about what it looks like or what it means to be a Christian. For example, when I was living in Wheaton um, as, a, as a pastor there, my wife and I bought our first home and we were getting to know our neighbors and the neighbor next door found out that I was a Baptist pastor. And she said, oh, Baptist pastor, you guys are the people who don't drink or smoke or have sex, right? I said, I've smoked before, you know. <laughs> and, and that's her idea of what it means to be a, a Christian. We can oftentimes wrongly define our understanding of, of what it means to follow Christ as a list of do's and don'ts, or who we vote for or don't vote for, who we align ourselves and who we avoid. But this is, is um, a wrong way of thinking or defining what it means to be a Christian. In fact, it really misses the point altogether. But on top of that, I've discovered that in my own life, I can adopt this way of thinking if I'm not careful. I can, I can reduce it to a list of behaviors. And then so seemingly inevitably, I begin to look at the people around me and kind of evaluate them or judge them based on these things. I create categories and I make assumptions about who people are and what motivates them. And it all becomes very unhealthy really quickly. But on the flip side of this, it's not as if the Bible doesn't have a few things to say about how we're supposed to live our lives. It's not as if the Bible doesn't address some of our behaviors and give us guidelines that it wants us to follow. It's not as if it doesn't tell us that to love someone is good or right and that we should do that and to hate someone is destructive or wrong. So it's not merely this abstract philosophy that has no real world implications. And, and if being a Christian is not merely a list of do's and don'ts, and matter of fact, I, I would argue or I would say that it's something totally different than that. But at the same time, if it addresses how we live, if it wants to speak with authority and, and conviction in our lives regarding our thoughts and our behaviors, then what's the connection? If it's not about that, but it's a frequent topic that, that scripture addresses, then, then how are we to understand both of these things? And, and I want us to take a few moments to kind of unpack this together. Um, we've been in a series uh, over the last several weeks entitled Built to Last, studying this ancient letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to these Christians in a town called Ephesus in what's now Turkey. It was in Asia Minor at the time. And all along here, he's been writing to this community of Christ followers, and he's, he's been talking a great deal about the message of Jesus, or what we oftentimes refer to in the church as the gospel. The good news about who Jesus is and what he has done for us. And for example, Paul starts his letter this way. And this is chapter 1, verse 3. But this is at the very outset. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
Like that's, a, that's a great way to start a letter. He's writing to these Christians and he tells them again that they have been given every spiritual blessing in Jesus. And this letter goes on like this. In fact, it goes on like this for the, the entire first half of the letter as he continues to remind them just how good the good news is. Everything that Jesus has done for them, everything that's available to them in that. And now in the second half of this letter, he is beginning to encourage the church. He wants to teach them just about this life-changing news and how it does exactly that. It, it changes our lives. You see, because in Paul's mind here, it's impossible to be blessed with every spiritual blessing and yet go on living the way we used to. Like for Paul, that doesn't add up. And so he's going to elaborate on this. This is now in Ephesians chapter 4. This is where we're going to pick things up today. We're going to begin in verse 17 and kind of work our way through the end of this chapter. This is the first section here. It says, now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They've become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him, and we're taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desire, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness in God, of God in true righteousness and holiness. So, so Paul is beginning to help us understand that our faith in Jesus affects the way we live. And he does so by calling us to put on a new life. Put on a new life. These verses here are laying a foundation for, for living our lives as followers of Jesus. There's a, there's a cause and effect logic that Paul is using here. And it begins with reminding the readers, he reminds his, his audience, that they must no longer walk as the Gentiles do, which is a curious thing to write to a group of Gentiles. Again, we have to think about this in light of everything that Paul has said up to this point in this letter. How, how previously he referred to this mysterious plan that God has been working from the very beginning of time, how in the Old Testament, God had drawn together a family and using that family that he was going to create a people that, to be present with. There was Israel and there was the Jewish people and there was everyone else who were referred to as the Gentiles. There were people that were in a covenant relationship with God and there were people who didn't have that. And God has done now something radical through Jesus. He words it this way in chapter 3, verse 6 in Ephesians. He says, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. So he's saying those who were once outside of this covenant relationship now have been invited in because of what Jesus has done. So Paul is saying to a group of people who were nationally or, or ethnically Gentiles, don't live as if you are still spiritually an outsider. Don't live as though you have not been changed by your relationship with God. Don't, don't live as though this isn't your reality. So Paul goes on to, to develop this a little bit. He says, don't live in the futility of your mind. Darken in your understanding. Don't live, Paul says, with a pre-Jesus way of thinking. Don't live as though you are alienated from the life of God because you've been invited into the family. What he called earlier is being adopted. Don't live with hardness of heart, becoming callous, just giving yourselves over to what, whatever pleasure or, or temporary meaning dulls the pain, right? Don't live as if this is all that there is, Paul says. And why? Verse 30, and here's the cause. Or no, verse 20. But that's not the way you learn Christ. That's not the way that you learn Christ. This is the transformative moment. 
He's saying to the church, you've learned Christ. When I was in middle school, going to my very first day of middle school, I, uh, you know, back in those days, and I think you still do, it's kind of fun to go pick out your outfit for the first day of school and, and that sort of thing. So my mom took me out shopping and, and, and got me kind of like dressed up and picked out this outfit. It was like a collared shirt and, and um, suspenders. I don't, I don't know why suspenders. And if I'm remembering correctly, I wore shorts with this. Um, <laughs> and I had huge glasses at the time and, and I like came to school, first day of middle school, and everybody, all of my friends, every guy there was wearing a Nike t-shirt and basketball shorts. Like, I looked like, like a missionary kid that just came back from, like, the Netherlands or something. <laughs> and, and everyone around me, and what, what I forgot, or I like to blame my mom for this, actually, is that there was a transformative moment that happened. I went to middle school, but I didn't make the transformation. Like, you show up to school first day like that, there's no recovering from that, people. <laughs> See, Paul is saying, you've had a transformative moment, so you should put on something different. There is a new self. He's saying, don't walk, don't live like Jesus hasn't transformed you. This is old self. This is old way of thinking. This is your old way of doing things. And verse 20 is actually a very unique phrase. See, it's the difference between knowing Jesus, having information about him, and knowing Jesus, having a relationship with him. See, this is what's changed, or better said, this is what's changed you. You learned Christ, Paul said. And because of that, put off the old self, verse 24, put on the new self created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. I, I want to just pause here for a second. I want us to feel the weight of what Paul has just said here to us. The new self that we've been told to put on is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The, the new self, this is God's perfection wrapped around us. This is his flawlessness, his sinlessness, his perfect life applied to me. So, so he's saying, take off those old, those beaten up, that torn up rags that you've been wearing around and put on Jesus' perfection and wear it as if it's your own. Like this is the spiritual equivalent of your wife saying to you, you're not going to go out like that, right? Paul is saying, don't go out like that. Don't live like that. Put on the perfection that God has equipped, that has given because of what Jesus Christ has accomplished. So understand this. Paul is reshaping our identity here. He's saying this is who you were. You were futile in your thinking. You were, you were darkened in your minds. You've been alienated from God. But then you met Jesus. And you will put your faith in him for the forgiveness of sins. So now live in this identity. This is who you are. If you know me, if you've been around me, especially if you've served with me with students, you know that I can talk about identity all day. Years and years of, of high school ministry have, um, and, and I feel sorry for our high school students that put up with that, because I think there'd be some times when they were like, you can talk about something else sometimes if you want to. But I understood that identity was so central, so core to their faith development. And moreover, that behavior came out of identity. That how we live, how we act is born out of our sense of identity. And so Paul is saying, put on a new self, put on a new identity, who God says that you are. And this putting on of our new self includes putting on a new mind, a new mind. You know, I have grew up with all boys in my home, um, with the exception of my mom. And, and even beyond that, of the 21 of my generation, 20 of us are boys. There was one girl born in, into our family in my generation. In fact, on the Moore side, my oldest daughter was the first girl born into the Moore family in 41 years. Like when I called to tell people, like, we had a girl, they were like, shut up. Like, what's his name? You know, and no, seriously, it's a girl. And so I've had to learn, having three daughters and a wife and a dog that's a girl, like everything is girl in my house. 
I have had to learn a new way of thinking. Like, I've had to learn things that sometimes people cry just for no reason at all. Like, <laughs> I, I've had to learn things that, like, having, like, a family movie night in ver involves very few, like, explosions in the movie and much more, like, romantic sort of comedy or something like that. Like, I've had to learn, and I love it. Like, I love being the dad of daughters. This is not, like, a, a knock. But I've had to learn to think differently, to look at things differently in the world that I live in now. See, the question that immediately comes to my mind when I think about what Paul has been telling us here is the question of how. Like, how do I put on the new self? Because according to Paul here, it involves changing the way we think. Let's look again back at verses 22 through 24. He says, to put off the old self, which belongs to the former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. See, we've already talked about this description of the old self, how it's marked with the futility of the mind and it's darkened in its understanding. The, these phrases suggest like cloudiness, confusion, um, unable to rightly perceive. And Paul says we need to have our minds renewed. In fact, in, in the book of Romans, in chapter 12, he says, Do not be conformed any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you, you may discern the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So to put on the new self, I have to renew my mind, or, or, or put more directly, to put on the new self, I have to agree with God's view of me. Let me say that again. To put on the new self, I have to understand and agree with the identity that God has given me. Not what Paul says is the pattern of this world and the identity that they want to force on me. And not even the, the uh, identity that I want to assume about myself. He says that's, that's old self-thinking and it needs to be renewed. Like I know sometimes even as Christians, like we can talk about who we are and it's almost like this self-loathing sort of unworthy way of understanding ourselves. Or we'll say phrases like, I'm just a sinner saved by grace, which is absolutely true, but we put all the emphasis on sinner and we sort of brush over the fact that we've been saved by grace. See, we can't reconcile that way of thinking with Paul's instruction here in verse 24 to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God and true righteousness and holiness. We can't combine those things. That's, that's old identity. That's old thinking. Colossians chapter 3, verse 10 says, put on the new self, which is being renewed after the image of its creator. Renewed after the image of its creator. Just for a point of application here. I would encourage you to start your day in the morning. When you wake up, splash a little water in your face, look in the mirror and say, today I am going to agree with what God says about me. Today I am going to start my day by agreeing with who God says that I am. Begin to renew your thinking, renew your mind, a new mind. All of this then leads to a new life. And this is where we start to get into how this impacts behavior because Paul addresses this here. This is now back in verse 25 of Ephesians 4. He says, Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each of you speak the truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such it is good for building up as it fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as, as God in Christ forgave you. See, I think the mistake that we, that we oftentimes make 
is that we read a passage like that in, in isolation, or we read it out of its context. And we, we look at God's standard for Christian living, and, and if we remove it from a context, we see it without the power of the transformation that's already been secured. And on top of that, and maybe this, I'm the only one, but I think we as human beings have authority issues. I think sometimes we, have, we, we, we buck against anything that, or anyone that tells us wants to do. Like even sometimes when I have like my GPS going, right? Uh, it's like the first half I know how to get there. I've got a faster way and like Siri's telling me to turn here or whatever. I'm like, I don't have to listen to you. You know, like that sort of thing. Like you're not the boss of me. And we, we, we can live our lives like this in a million different ways. So we can read passages like here in Ephesians when we recoil against anything that we feel like is, is limiting or restrictive. As a culture, this is particularly true when we think about like sexuality. It, to, to put any boundaries or any guidelines, and Paul gets into this in, in Ephesians chapter 5, which is this same flow of thought. Paul's going to address that area much more specifically. And so anything that, that puts limits on us, we say, well, that's oppressive or that's repressive or whatever. Like we, we, we react against any authority in our lives, but when we do this, when we recoil against God's directions for Christian living, we are completely missing the point. Look again at, at how these verses start. He says, therefore, put away falsehood. Like, again, Paul is saying, because you've been renewed in the spirit of your minds, because you've put off the old self and you are agreeing with, with the identity that God has placed on you, then exchange old living, old self-living for new self-living. He helps us understand what this looks like. In verse 25, he says, stop lying. That's old self. Start telling the truth. That, that's new self-living. That's, that's what he produces in us. In verse 26 and 27, he says, it's okay to be angry in the new self. There's things that should make us angry. But he says, in your anger, don't sin. That's old self-living. Verse 28, stop stealing. That's old self Start working hard and being generous, giving to the community around you. That's new self-living. Verse 29, stop corrupt talking. Stop tearing people down. That's old self. Build each other up. Speak grace to each other. That, that's new self-living. Verse 31, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Old self, be kind to one another tender-hearted, forgiving one another. That's new self-living. Why? As Christ, as God in Christ forgave you. Because you've been made new. Here's what Paul wants us to understand. Behavior in our lives, the way we live our lives is anchored in identity and identity is anchored in our relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Romans 6, verse 6 says it this way. It says, we know that the old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. In, in verse 30 of Ephesians 4, Paul says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God. This is the result, the consequence of forgetting our identity and living in the old self, it's, it's that idea that we have as parents when we see our kids make decisions that we know are bad for them, and we're like, don't do that. Don't do that. I love you. This is bad for you. This is not who you are. Like, it damages the relationship. That's what happens when we live in the old self. And finally, Paul makes the point that all of this is rooted in a new love. A new love. Look at the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 5. I read this yesterday at a, at a wedding. It says, Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. See, here's really the heart behind what Paul wants us to understand, the instructions that he's given here for Christian living. He says it's, it's all born out of, of love. 
because you've experienced, because you have received God's incredible love, he says, then walk in love. Imitate God, not in an effort to earn his love. Imitate God because you are loved. See, this is what empowers all of this. The, the, the power of Christian living isn't about being a better person. It's not about my capacity for good. It's his love. It's his love for me. It's his love for you. It's his love for us. See, it's important that we understand the order of what happens here. It really ultimately all begins with God's love. That's what Paul's been talking about for three chapters. When received, how it creates a new self by the renewing of our mind, and the renewing of our mind leads to a new life. Our behavior is the outworking of these other things, these other truths that have, that have unfolded. See, the problem results when we get that out of order. We put behavior ahead of those other things, and it becomes this unending effort to earn that which has already been accomplished. That's when it just sort of becomes self-righteousness, and that never ends well. It never ends well. And I'll conclude with this, but, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that I have three daughters. And one of the things that I'm really committed to in my relationship with the three of them is to model to them what it looks like to to be loved um, I don't I don't do that perfectly they'll gladly tell you that but I, I'm committed to it I, I really want them to know what it looks like for them to be loved by their dad and I have a couple motivations behind it one is when some boys start hanging around my house I, I want my daughters to have experienced love so that they can know and identify something that's unloving um, I want them to be able to see that and know the difference. If they can't, then I'll jump in and help out. <laughs> but I also believe that a, that a powerful experience of love teaches us how to love others. That, that I can train or equip my daughters as their father by loving them really well to be people that love really well. And I want that for them. I want that for their husband-wife relationship someday. I want that for them in the way that they react and treat and, and come around their kids. I want people, their friends and family members to feel that from them. See, a, a powerful experience of love can be, a, can be an incredible thing in our lives. And so Paul says, may we imitate, may we model the powerful experience of love that God has given to us. That's why we live for him. That's what motivates all of it. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day and this opportunity to be together, to look into your word and continue to be challenged by Paul's incredible letter to this church. And God, help us to understand that, that following after you in our lives isn't born out of some um, goal that we have to achieve. Help us to understand that following you in our lives is born out of a brand new identity that you've placed on us by means of your sacrifice when we place our faith in you. May we live in the new self and may others see that in us and come to know you as a result. Amen. It's been addiction. Um, if we can pray with you, you know, we have a team of people, and I say this every week up here, that's available to pray. Maybe you've struggled. Maybe that, that sense of like, putting off the old self and taking on the new is, is, is just something you've been wrestling with. And we'd love to pray with you, pray over you with that. Or maybe there's just some completely unrelated. And if you would like to be prayed with, it's a privilege to do that. And I'm going to kind of have our prayer team sort of on this side of the room over here to my right, because over here to my left, we're going to have, if you're ready to run a marathon, and I know you all are, I can see a lot of marathon runners in here. Come talk to Bruce and Greg. If you just want to get more information, come hear more about the vision. We'd love to have you be a part of this. And they're going to, they're going to kind of meet over here to my left. Now receive the morning's benediction. Go now in the name of Jesus Christ, by whom we have the power to put off the old self and take on the new. May we live in that. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.